Good evening and welcome to a different sort of edition of Bronx Talk. Different because, of course, you can see we're working in BronxNet South Bronx Multimedia Center, but also because in our 30 years of Bronx Talk, including more than 90 political debates, this is the first time we've ever done a forum of potential district leaders. There's an unusually competitive dialogue in the race for male and female district leaders in the 81st Assembly District between the Benjamin Franklin Reform Democratic Club and the Unity Democratic Club. So tonight we'll interview them each separately so voters in that district can be educated about their choices and voters in all Bronx districts can get an education about district leaders and what are their roles in a functional democracy. So to start, please join me in welcoming from the Benjamin Franklin Reform Democratic Club. It is uh, Attorney Benjamin Jackson. Mr. Jackson, nice to see you. Great to be here. Thanks for having Thank us. Thank you. And um, Emily Hausman is the director of the Infant and Toddler Center at SAR Academy. Thank you for that, and of course, also thank you for being with us. Thank you for having us, Gary. Let, let's just, um, we'll start with you, Ms. Hausman. Um, let's talk about your career in education. You came in here and said, you know what, this is what, um, this is a little different for me because I spent my day in front of two and three and four year olds. <laughs> um, I, I, but how does that um, inform your uh, potential work as a, a district leader? Gary, thank you so much for asking. As a running for district leader, I'm striving to serve the community I live, work, and raise my four kiddos in, in a very deep way. During the COVID-19 pandemic, I ran an emergency school for the Department of Education, and I saw what stepping up to the plate could really do for our community. And I hope to continue that work as a district leader. What do you mean by stepping up to the plate? We opened a school, an in-person school, when the rest of the city was shut down for the children of frontline healthcare workers. Mm -hmm. And so you believe that kind of hands-on approach, those kinds of things are the kinds of realities maybe that you could do as a district leader? Yes, really digging deep and answering the needs of our community. Mm -hmm. uh, but you've never been involved in politics before, or maybe I shouldn't make that assumption. Um, I was involved in politics from a policy standpoint. I believe deeply in early childhood education and child care and that we need it for the world to function. So as the city rolled out, um, sorry, pre-K for all already existed in the city when I came onto the right. scene. But as the city rolled out and expanded 3K for all, um, I really pushed and advocated for that to bring it to our community and our district years before it was planned to be there. And, and so you, you saw that as a, a positive use of, of political advocacy, et cetera. Of course, now there's a big dialogue about 3K. That's, there, we'll save that for another time. Uh, Mr. Jackson, what about you? You're an attorney. How does uh, that work inform uh, what you do? Sure, yeah. I mean, so what, what I, you're hoping to do. What I'm hoping to do. So I... Um, I, by day, am a plaintiff securities fraud attorney. What that means is that I try to hold big corporations and their executives accountable when they have defrauded uh, pension funds, retirement systems, employee benefit funds. So really, it's, it's corporate accountability law. And so what I take very seriously is my role as an advocate. And I've learned how to be a very effective advocate in the courtroom. And I'm hoping to take those advocacy skills that I've learned um, to the job of being a district leader, which in large part is an advocacy position. Maybe you could help uh, our, our viewers understand it better and define it because people say, oh, he, he's running for district leader. Nobody really knows what that means. Uh, so why don't you define how you see it and then uh, Ms. Hausman will ask you the same question. Sure, yeah. I mean, the, the job of a district leader is really um, to work with the local elected officials, um, the uh, Assemblyman, the city council member, um, Congress people, um, everyone across the board to get stuff done and, and make sure that the needs of the community are being met and that the voices in the community are being heard. And it's also to get Democrats elected uh, up and down the ballot. But it's also more than that because the district leaders have uh, an important role to play in the uh, Bronx Democratic Party. They help elect the chair of the county party. They vote at county committee meetings. They uh, help uh, get poll workers hired, uh, and they also help pick judicial candidates. So it's a very important role. I, I just want to follow one question, then Ms. Hausman will ask you the same question. Uh, when you say help an elected official, let them know what your neighbors are saying, or you write, help them write legislation, I mean, what, what is that help? 
So I'll, I'll give a great example. So we, uh, in the course of running for district leader, we've gone to all the different corners of our district, you know, every single neighborhood. And our right. team has been out there knocking on doors, talking to people. And we have a very good, you know, finger on the pulse of what's going on in the community. And when we hear about concerns that people have, we let, you know, our assembly, uh, our assemblyman, Jeffrey Dinerwitz, who we work with, know what, what people are thinking. And that's a very important job uh, for an assembly district leader is to work with the assembly person. I'm assuming you agree with much of what he said, but from your perspective uh, and you as a district leader with a strong background in education, early childhood education, how, how does that play? So I've seen through my work in education what a difference it can make when we are all part of the conversation and we have open lines of communication with our local elected officials. Again, my emergency school could not have run without the support of the local elected officials. Back a year ago, when local schools were facing shutdowns because of lack of payment from the Department of Education, we were able, with the help of Council Member Dinowitz, to bring everybody to the table, the heads of the Department of Education and local heads of schools, in order to make sure that they received payment and remained open for their communities. And without those relationships and those conversations, that couldn't that have happened. might not have happened in this. So mm -hmm. then you become an advocate for the general public on that issue and maybe other issues as well. This has been a, an interesting uh, competition. There's no uh, avoiding it. Um, the uh, unity members that try to, they claim they wanted to be members of the uh, Benjamin Franklin Reform Democratic Club because it had been around for so long. Um, but they said they felt like they weren't welcome. You can both weigh in on it. What what happened, and, and do you find that to be an unfortunate thing? Do you want, do you want to answer that? Sure. I mean, I, that has definitely not been my experience with the Benjamin Franklin Reform Democratic Club. I've never felt uh, unwelcome there, uh, you know, and whatever the disputes that the Unity folks had, those are really from before our time. I mean, what we are really interested in here is moving our district and moving our party forward, uh, getting results for the people in our district and not relitigating fights, uh, fights that people have had in the past. You know, um, I, I think it's interesting, and I, I frankly wanted to find the right forum to bring this up, and, and we're going to bring on the Unity uh, Democratic um, uh, candidates as well. Um, but... Um, what this has done is created a bit of a split uh, politically. In other words, uh, uh, Jeffrey Dinowitz and his, his son Eric Dinowitz, who are two elected officials, uh, are on one team, so to speak, and uh, Robert Jackson and Gustavo Rivera are on, an, are on another team when there's a common interest. I mean, they're all Democrats, and they largely see things the same way. Like, and the, the example that came to mind was the cricket stadium, that nobody in the area wanted the cricket stadium. But when there was a press conference, neither Robert Jackson nor Gustavo Rivera was there. To me, it lightens the power of the whole community. Uh, and, any thoughts on that, on those kinds of things? Is there a way to bring the elected officials together? Or is this really a, a you know, a, a tight uh, separation that's going to exist for a while? Gary, thank you so much for asking. I was actually hiking through Van Cortlandt Park on Sunday morning. And isn't it a wonderful <laughs> park? It's the greatest park in the, the city. Greatest oh, park in New York, the greatest park in New York City. And I was walking with a friend who has lived in the Bronx for 50 years. And she said to me, can you believe there was almost a cricket stadium here? Oh, and I said, goodness. can you believe we came together and the power of togetherness <laughs> stopped it? Um, well, that is that is true, but I, you understand what I'm saying. Absolutely. Is that I, I felt like from an elected official point of view, they all should have been there, even though there is a, a split uh, politically, I suppose. So go ahead. You can finish what you said. Um, so to this point, I, I take something from my husband's in art as a New York National Guard chaplain. And he says he's a Jewish chaplain, but he says he's a chaplain for all soldiers. And I think that we are district leaders for all Democrats. And moving forward, if we're elected, we want to bring everybody that wants to come to the conversation. We make room for all voices to be heard. We have said the entire time that we've been running that we want to build an inclusive 
big tent Democratic Party that's friendly to all Democrats, where everyone feels welcome, and we're willing to work with any elected officials who have shared goals. Uh, and I would also say that we are not just supported, by the way, by Assemblyman Jeffrey Dinowitz and Councilmember Eric Dinowitz. We've also been endorsed by Bronx Borough President Vanessa Gibson. We've also been endorsed by Congressman Adriano Espaillat. Uh, if you saw the press conference that Richie Torres had uh, before Donald Trump came to the Bronx, uh, last week we were standing with him on the stage. So, you know, like we said, we are willing to work with, with lots of different folks. Both of the uh, clubs uh, talk, uh, uh, the district leader candidates talk about um, wanting to increase voter turnout. This be is a very big thing. Uh, and every, everybody on the Democratic side says they want to elect, uh, uh, re-elect Joe Biden. Um, how do you do that? How do you increase voter turnout in a county that historically has not had vo strong voter turnout. Uh, there's a lot of suspicion of, you know, elected officials and the political process. H how do you change that and get people to the polls? Yeah, I think um, it's it's hard work, uh, and I know because I've done it. I've done it at a national scale. I was the national uh, voter assistance and protection hotline director for the Clinton campaign. I also worked on that team for the Biden campaign. Uh, you have to make a lot of phone calls. You have to recruit a big team to make your effort bigger than yourself. You have to make sure that you're calling people to sign them up to volunteer for the campaign uh, and let people know about the election. And it's just a lot of calling and door knocking and recruiting people and hard work, but it's the sort of work that um, we love doing and that uh, we will continue doing if we're elected as district leaders. I'm sure you want to weigh in on that. Yes, absolutely. And it's actually hard work that we're doing already. Our club and our suite was the only club in the district petitioning for Joe Biden. Um, when it came time for our own names to be on the ballot, along with our entire slate of candidates, we reached every corner of the district. We ran a full slate for all electoral districts, and that's something that you only do when your feet hit the ground, and we're really proud of that work. Uh, fi final um, question for both of you. What are the issues that you hear? You, I, I know you both told me you ring in doorbells. What are the issues that you hear uh, from um, uh, people that, uh, we'll start with you, Ms. Hausman, um, that, that you say, hey, maybe I can bring this to uh, the assembly member or to the council member or to the congress member? Thank you for thank you for asking, and I take it the educational approach um, to voters the same one I do to early childhood, and that is every voter every child is different and every voter is different. So while we're out there door knocking, we're taking notes um, about what people care about. We know that the city of yes is weighing on people's mind. And so the that's one of the issues. We're going to run out of time. I want to give uh, Mr. Jackson a chance to uh, respond. Absolutely, yeah. Aff affordable housing, um, the city of yes and what it means for the neighborhood, whether we'll be able to retain you know, local control over where development in our neighborhood happens. So people are very concerned about that, safety. But also, I think most importantly, how do we prevent Donald Trump from becoming president another time. I mean, that is very top of mind for people. People do not want to go back to that dark place where we were several years ago. And, you know, making sure that we do everything we can to get Joe Biden reelected, that is 100 percent what our focus would be in the fall. Ben Jackson, Emily Hausman, good luck in uh, the rest of the campaign. Uh, we're thrilled that you came down here to the South Bronx and uh, we'll uh, see you around town one way or the other. We appreciate your time. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much. Right, we're going to take a short break, and then, as promised, the Unity Democrats will be here, and uh, we'll have a conversation with them. Don't go away. Okay, back with you on uh, Bronx Talk. Uh, tonight we're doing interviews with district leader candidates in the 81st Assembly District, and now it is the Unity Democratic Club, uh, both of whom are incumbent uh, district leaders. So Abigail Martin, the incumbent female district leader and political director at Illinois Legacy, nice to have you with us. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. And uh, Ramdat Singh, uh, the incumbent male district leader, special education teacher. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so uh, much. Let's start with you, Mr. Singh. Um, what, what about your job as a um, uh, special ed teacher? 
informs what you do as a, and what you've been doing as a district leader and what you would do if you're continued, uh, be able to continue in that position? Yeah, so my, my job as a special education teacher, um, I teach high schoolers. Um, and I love my high schoolers. Um, they they're make my day uh, every day. Um, but one part of that is being able to break down things, um, being able to make it more manageable. Um, sometimes people understand how politics or these positions impact them or why they should be voting. And that's something that me in my trade as a teacher, I'm able to do with uh, people that we're talking to um, being able to break down and make politics more manageable to people and kind of explain to them why they should be voting in every election, not just the presidential election. Uh, did you find it effective? I mean, you, you were in the position. Did you find that you were able to accomplish uh, some of those goals to educate the, um, uh, the uh, I almost said the viewership, the voting public? I think of viewership. He thinks of voting public. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, when I go, I talk to people, um, they actually become excited when they hear a, a teacher wants to talk to them about politics and how um, politics and the way people are voting impacts the work that I do in my classroom and how that impacts my students, whether or not they're getting the resources or the education they deserve. So, you know, putting those and making those connections, it's something that makes people excited and they want to be able to vote more and more. Um, hearing from a teacher and learning how it relates back to their daily life or how it's being impacted to their kids. Uh, Ms. Martin, uh, now we know you because you ran for office and, and you know you debated on our program in the past. You've I been did. involved in politics. Um, talk about your own background, your own point of view when it comes to being the uh, female district leader in the 81st and what, what, what you bring to that position and what you have brought to that position. Sure, I think I bring a lot to that position. I bring a lot as a mother who lives in our community. I have three children that attend PS81, which is in um, a public school in our community. And uh, professionally, I'm a social worker. So I started my career in the Bronx Family Court advocating for children in foster care family court judges would assign us to assist in any sort of problem that was occurring in a foster care case. So in doing that work, I learned how the education system, the Department of Education works in New York City. I, worked, I learned how the homeless system worked, uh, the housing system. I learned how to help youth apply for jobs, the summer youth employment pro program, any system throughout New York City. I learned how to nav navigate on behalf of my clients. And so when I was making the decision to run for office, I felt it was really important to have the perspective of a social worker, of somebody who understands um, working with people in poverty, with different challenges throughout New York City, and also having the perspective of being a mom and bringing that to the table. And, and can you uh, cite either examples or some ways that, that you actually were able to apply it over, over your time as a district leader? Um, as district leader, so absolutely. So, you know, Ramdat and I love to talk to the community. We're out there, we're talking to people, and even though it's outside the purview of a district leader, we have people that come to us with problems all the time. You know, whether it's that they are concerned about um, mopeds on a sidewalk, or they're concerned about their child not getting services in school that they need, or their child not getting evaluations. So multiple times, I've been able to connect people with um, the resources that they need to get the resources to address the problem. So I'm not providing the services, but I know where they need to go to, to get what the help that they need. Uh, the reason that we decided, and, and you both know this, the reason that we decided to, to do this for the first time, we've never really done a program with district leaders and, who are campaigning before, was because of the competition between the Unity Democratic Club and the uh, Ben Franklin Reform Democratic Club. Something happened along the way, maybe Ms. Martin, you could talk about it, that in other words, you folks were ready to be part of the Ben Franklin Club, but then said, well, wait a minute, we didn't feel welcome, we didn't, something happened. Maybe you could talk a little bit about what happened and kind of got us into this competition, because it's heavier than in just about all the other districts in the Bronx. Sure, I don't like to, 
to, to think of it as a competition, really. Okay. When Rambat and I were running in 2022, there were multiple people in the community who told us, oh, I tried to get involved in the Ben Franklin Club and they didn't want me. I walked in those doors and I turned around and I walked right out because it was clear that I wasn't welcome there. I myself tried to join the Ben Franklin Club and was never, my, my membership request was never responded to. I know other people where it's the same But why case. do you think that is? That seems un curious, let's put it that way. I'm not sure. I think that you would have to ask them. But, you know, as a district leader, it, part of our responsibility is to act as a liaison between the Democratic Party and the community. And if the community is telling us they want a Democratic club and they don't feel welcome at the one that exists, it just made sense to to create a new one, to create one that is welcoming Did you want to, to um, respond to that as well? We'll give you the opportunity to do that. Yeah, I mean, our, the Unity Democratic Club was just founded as a welcoming to all you know, aspects of the Democratic Party. We are diverse in every aspect of the word, uh, race, the work, union or non-union, but also in ideology. And the Unity Democratic Club welcomes everyone. Um, and I think now we are going into our second year, I think most people feel welcome and you know, we are been putting on programming and aspects of the club that people feel like they can come back to. And I think that's something we're really proud of actually is being able to create an organization within our first term in being district leader and have people say like, you know, what you're doing and here in this club is actually fruitful and we appreciate that and we feel like we want to come back all the time. You know, it's interesting to me because um, Jeff and Eric Dinowitz are uh, obviously part of the Ben Franklin uh, Democratic Club and uh, Robert Jackson and Gustavo Rivera see themselves as unity Democrats. Uh, I, I just thought it was interesting and I brought it up uh, when they were here a, a few moments ago when we um, when there was the protest about the cricket stadium which there was unanimity mm -hmm. about I mean, everybody in the area said this is not a good idea for Van Cortlandt Park um, but the press conference only had half of the elected officials there because the others weren't part of it is that unfortunate does that hurt the community to have that kind of a, a split or is it just kind of the, the nature of things? I don't, I don't know, do you, do you want to Yeah, I'd to like that? to speak to that. So Ramdad and I were there at that press conference and I know that Gustavo Rivera wasn't there because he was out of town. And Robert Jackson, um, he was in support. He was aligned well, with what I, the community I wanted. So I don't think that there was a, um, I don't think there was a divide I'm happy to hear that the, the clubs on I, that I, issue. I, I, I get the sense that, you know, if one group is doing it and then the other is not. Um, the other thing I want, I want to ask you about is there were discrepancies in filings. And, of course, in this day and age when uh, there's a lot of concern, are the right people running, right. Or is there fraud in our ballots, et cetera, et cetera. So um, what happened and, and um, what is your response to people who say, well, wait a minute, if they do that, we can't have, obviously we can't have that in our uh, electoral system. Right, so, you know, running for office, um, having all of the parts to run for office, it, there's a lot. Um, and, you know, there are parts of that that sometimes mistakes happen, in, especially in a cover sheet. Um, and a cover sheet is what the Board of Elections looks at in order to make sure that you get on the ballot. Mm -hmm. So what happened this time was there was an error on, the, on one of our cover sheets uh, for one of our slate members who's our state committee member and we weren't served the notice in due time to be able to correct that deficiency. I see. So, you know, just because we weren't allowed a lot of the time to correct that deficiency the Board of Elections, uh, the commissioners deemed that the cover sheet was inaccurate and it didn't match the, the information that on, was on the, the petition. So whatever happened was the commissioners then... Uh, said this is not valid. Right, and, and knocked our state committee candidate, Morgan Evers, right. our incumbent uh, state committee member, off the ballot. And then, you know, we took it to court um, and it was still deemed a little too late. And, you know, that's unfortunate because, uh, you know, she was a really great state committee member in 
representing our entire state. But it, it is important. Let's. Uh, right. I don't want to take more time on it, but it is important to get these things right and right. have them filed properly. Uh, I mean, did yeah, you want to weigh in on I do it? want to speak to that. So we mm -hmm. had over 1,200 signatures, right? There's a number of different ways that people can get thrown off the ballot, quote unquote. Fraudulent signatures is one very common way, which was not the issue here. We had over 1,200 voters throughout our district that wanted a choice. It came down to a matter of an error on a, um, on a cover sheet, which is very common. It happens all the time, which is why the Board of Elections has a procedure to amend the cover sheets. It was merely one digit on an address. And so unfortunate, unfortunately, we didn't catch it in time. There was some issues with the mail and, and all of that. But I think that this just outlines how difficult it is for grassroots candidates and grassroots clubs that don't have tons of resources or attorneys doing this to get on the That's ballot. Uh, thank you very much for um, uh, directly addressing that. Um, both um, clubs talk about the importance of increasing voter turnout. Mm -hmm. um, how do you do it? Do you bel believe that you know in the years that you've been a female district leader that you've been able to do that? And how do we do that going forward? There's a lot of things that contribute to voter turnout, and we have seen, a, I think, a 20-year <coughs> decline in voter turnout in the Bronx. I mean, one of the reasons why I ran for district leader is because I was so shocked at how low voter turnout was in the city council race. It's really quite a problem. A number of factors that lead to it. People think the system is rigged. People think their votes don't matter. People think that you know, don't realize that it's your local electeds who address what's happening on your sidewalk and in your community. Um, and so it's going to take a while to undo decades of disinvestment in certain um, voter sections of our Just community. Just so we don't run out of time. So it's voter education. It's simply a matter of doing what we're doing yeah. tonight, for example. Right. Voter education and reaching out and continuously having conversations with the community, not just when you need their vote. Um, did you want to have a, a say about that before we went Yeah, so also one key in is voter engagement and education, but also it's targeting our youth, making sure our youth are actually registered and also that they understand why they need to vote. Um, and that's key on voter education uh, as a whole. To me, yeah, I have to agree, to me, youth is a very, very yeah. important thing. Presumably, you and regardless of who the elected officials are will be working to uh, get Joe Biden reelected. Absolutely. That's, uh, I'm assuming, a, a main priority. Uh, so listen, I just want to thank you both uh, for joining us. Abigail Martin, did you want to add I one did. Thing? I did. We're not only going to be working to get Joe Biden elected, but we're going to be working to pass the New York Equal Rights Amendment Act. Oh, that is go. so important. That's an amendment to the Constitution. It's going to enshrine and protect everybody's rights throughout New York State. You're going to have to flip your ballot over and vote yes. And that's going to drive turnout for Biden. Ta in tandem, we have to work for both. You vote yes on that possibility. Of course. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the Equal uh, Rights Amendment is important. Listen, um, uh, Abigail Martin, thank you so much. Ram Dutt Singh, thank you so much. Thank Good you luck so much. in the rest of the campaign, and we appreciate your time with us this evening. And we got a lot of people to thank. We thank our producer, Stephen Powell, who pinched it, pinch hit, who DH today. Our director is Will Guzman. The editor is Yessi Diaz. We have a cast of thousands working with us in the studio. And to you, too, the people of the Bronx. So... If the curtain don't fall and the creek don't rise, we'll be here next week. Good night.